Welcome back to Bobbington. And staying with the early war kick we're on right now, we're looking at their Panzer 3L. In the mid-1930s, there were a couple of developments which affected German tank design, even once one started to accept the fact that the Versailles restrictions were no longer really worth the current value of the railway car in which they were signed. One was the acceptance that there was a need for tanks both to engage soft targets and other tanks, which were starting to get a tad tougher. However, any attempts to manufacture a tank which was general purpose tended to result in compromises which would either limit the anti-infantry or anti-tank capability. Usually, anti-infantry was chosen to suffer as evidenced by the prevalence of cannons in the 37 to 47 mm range in the interwar period. Soft targets would be happily engaged by short-barreled large caliber cannon on a support vehicle insofar as 75mm was considered to be a large caliber at the time. In the meantime, the Germans, like most other countries, put an anti-tank gun into their standard tank. What would become the Panzer III would mount the same 37mm gun as the anti-tank units were equipped with. The 37 was powerful enough to knock out enemy tanks, after all that's why it was the anti-tank gun in the first place, whilst not being so big as to reduce ammunition capacity, loading time, or time of flight, which affected accuracy. The other minor detail was the fact that anti-tank guns were starting to become quite dangerous to tanks. The French 25mm was singled out as being a particular threat by the Waffenamt to Automotive Design Office as being low, hard to hit, rapid fire, and hard hitting. This led to a design problem. Up until then, the limit of the weight of a tank was either 8 tons or 18 tons, because that was the weight capacity limit of the bridges that the German army used at the time. After much consideration, it was decided that the 18-ton limit would have to be discarded. The earliest Panzer III's with their 15 mm of armor were going to have to be up-armored and up-weighed. The Panzer III's one would see marauding their way through France thus were generally of the F and G models with 37 mm guns and 3 cm of armor. Although the Panzers were generally successful, some changes were still necessary. The armor was still insufficient, and Zusatz Panzer started being added. Uh, that's a kind of a bolt-on applique. The other was the fact that the French tanks were proving to be rather difficult nuts to crack. Thus, the increase in main gun caliber to 5 cm. Fortunately, the 5 cm upgrade had been foreseen when the Panzer III was designed, and room in the turret allowed for it. And thus it was, from the late G models through to the J. There was, though, a catch. Rheinmetall had an L60 5cm gun, and Hitler had personally ordered its installation to replace the 37mm. However, all the tank experts concluded that the large gun simply could not be fitted into the Panzer III's turret for a variety of reasons, and hence the shorter L42 was mounted. Adolf was not particularly happy that his instruction had been overruled, and despite, again, the experts saying it wasn't an option, Director Panton from Alcat decided he'd like a crack at it. And it worked. This achieved great favor from Hitler, and the order went out to put the bigger gun into the tank in April 41. It would take several months to get the tank, the L model, into production. Thus, we have here an L model with the 5cm L60. For those of you new to Inside the Chieftain's Hatch, we tend to start on the outside going over the various points of interest, and then in part two we check out the interior. In a similar manner to most German tanks, the vehicle was incrementally improved in even small details during the production run. Thus, to the Cognoscenti, or at least those of us who have access to reference books to look this sort of thing up because, frankly, it's too much to remember, you can quickly tell that this vehicle appears to have left the factory between March and September of 1942. The tells are the fact that the turret has no vision ports on the sides, and this started happening around March, and it also retains the escape hatches in the hull. They started being deleted in June and were no longer being produced at all by October. Things can further be narrowed down by use of smaller details from there, but frankly, we're not gonna go into it. One of the significant features of this tank compared to pretty much any other tank in production at the beginning of World War II was that it was welded. Really, only the Soviets and Swedes, both of whom the Germans were rather cozy with in the 1930s, were mass-producing welded tanks. 
The tank retains the somewhat boxy look common to, say, British or German vehicles from most of the war. And the person to blame for this was a bloke by the name of Dr. Rao, who had decided that sloped armor for only maybe 10 degrees would be more than adequate to protect the tank without suffering the volumetric problems inherent in sloped armor. As Henry Dahl put it, it wasn't that the Germans didn't understand sloped armor, they just didn't think it was worth the effort. As is common in such times, warfare accelerated development significantly. The 15mm of the first Panzer III had given way to 3cm of the first mass-produced tanks, and by the time we get to this L, the front plate is 5cm thick. Even then, this tank has been given an additional 2cm of Vorpanzer, which is spaced armor. The bracket for the mantlet of Vorpanzer is present, but manufacturing issues led to many vehicles being fitted for, but not with. In addition to the port for the driver's vision and the bow mount for the machine gun, you also have the Notec low visibility light and two regular headlights. Between 15 to 23 track links can also be commonly found on the front hull uh, on two racks, although only the one lower rack is present on this vehicle, the other would go up here. And finally, we also have two access hatches for the steering and brake systems on the shallow front slope. They are unfortunately not spring-loaded. So once you've opened up these two hatches, which are held in place by two latches per hatch, opened obviously from the inside, you always had a good view of the steering and braking system and the transmission. And you will note one of the significant issues is that almost none of the components in here, although they are easily accessed for routine maintenance, are going to fit out through this little hatch. And we'll come back to that in a moment. The definitive running gear on the Panzer III is a very large sprocket wheel up front, six pairs of road wheels on the side, and then another large idler at the back. Now, they look like they're pairs of road wheels. They sort of are, but they are permanently attached by welded tubes, keeping one road wheel attached to the other. So anyway, here's your pro tip for the day. If you're looking at a German AFV and you can't tell if it's based off of a Panzer III or a Panzer IV, count the amount of wheels per side and divide by two. There are some minor exceptions, but it's a pretty effective rule of thumb. Most of these exceptions are as a result of the experimentation before the E-model of different suspension types. They finally decided on torsion bars. Uh, this is certainly not the first tank to have such a system, and the Germans weren't quite yet wedded to it, as they valued the extra 46 inches of space that were inside the tank above the hull floor, and the torsion bars took up. I will point out that the torsion bars actually don't have all that huge a range of motion. You see bump stops here. The lead road wheel does have a little bit greater flex, but still it's surprisingly limited. The single dry pin tracks are 38 centimeters wide. There are 93 links aside. They have a 12 centimeter pitch. They're held in place by these little pins here, which look like they were simply hammered back into a bent shape to hold the main pin in position. So it looks like that if you want to pull a pin out, you gotta hammer this straight first, then pull out the cotter pin, then pull out the main pin. The system will cross a 2.3 meter trench, climb a 60 centimeter obstacle, and will ford about 80 centimeters of water. As you come around to the side of the tank, you see the wide track shield, which has been embossed for additional traction, which is a nice touch. Another touch, and I don't know why they did this, is uh, the interior of this bin here has wooden lining, even the lid. Really don't see the point, but it's there. As you move further to the back, wire cutters, one of the visors in the side hole for vision, and you can start to see here the various bolts which hold together the top of the hull to the bottom of the hull. 
And the reason you do this is, you remember those small hatches that were too small for the transmission to get out of? The way to get the transmission or steering system out of this tank is you pull the turret, you unbolt all these bolts, then you pull the upper hull, then you pull the transmission all the way back up and out, which you better hope that your transmission didn't break down all that much. Continuing further back, hand crank for the starter, radio mount. As you can see, it folds back and down. It has little leaf springs here to stop the antenna from flapping around too much. This is a lock for the doors. It holds the front door in an open position, uh, partially for safety, but partially also it'll work for protection against enemy fire. Finally, on the side as you come back, some of the basic Pioneer tools, the grill for air intake, and one of the lift attachment points for lifting up this entire section. You can see the gap of the upper hull. As near as we can tell, talking with one of the guys here, what they do is they pull out the visors, they remove them entirely, they pass a sling in one visor, out the other, and that gives you your forward attachment points together with the rear attachment points. Definitely not convenient. Track tension is conducted by use of the large bolt here. It's a fairly unoriginal system. You simply turn the bolt, it's attached to the worm drive, and it moves the idler backwards or forwards. Basic. I've traversed the turret over to the three o'clock position, which is necessary to allow us to open up the engine decks. And this shows you the size of the holes that were put in for the tropical modification for the tanks that saw service in North Africa. And of course, the mushroom housings to cover the big gap. Underneath, the motor is a Maybach HL120. It's a, an 11.9 liter water-cooled V12, putting out about 285 horse at uh, 2800 RPM. It's connected to a six-speed transmission, giving a maximum speed forwards of about 40 kilometers an hour, which really isn't bad for the time. Reverse speed, five and a half. Underneath me here is the 320 liter fuel tank. It will get the tank about 155 kilometers on road. Oil is a little bit further to the front here. Now, this system was such that the oil would settle to the bottom of the tank if the engine hadn't been run in a while. Thus, the hand starter. The manual is fairly specific that the standard method of starting this tank, or the related Stug 3, would be by the hand starter, the electric motor starter was only to be used in case of emergency, i.e. somebody is shooting at you right now. Now this may also partially just be because of battery drain, maybe the unreliability of the motor, but talk to the mechanics here, they always have to be careful about the oil. And it would be a similar matter to say the radial engines on aircraft or the American tanks that you had to hand crank it before you got going. The system is water cooled, so the filler points are here, the grills are located further down and they have air passed over them by way of large fans which are belt driven and visible under these housings here. I'll just mention very briefly the rack at the back which is certainly convenient for carrying when in this case either water or petrol, ammunition, but just as likely personal gear. Lastly on the outside of the tank, the stowage bin. It is the envy of the civilized world and very few tanks even by the end of the war had such a capacious room to place your personal items and anything else you wanted to carry around with you. We've about run out of the exterior items to look at for this episode, so we'll be back in part two to check out the inside. See you then.